Hello, and welcome to All the Games You Like Are Bad. I'm your unapologetic scrub, Mark Bigney, and today we're going to be talking about Codex by David Serlin. David Serlin is a very interesting man who's done very interesting things. Additionally, he's attracted some degree of controversy, often less for what he's done, although I do wish he would display a little bit more deference and acknowledgement towards those he's cribbed from, i.e. stolen from mercilessly, uh, but often because of how he presents himself. And I'm very sympathetic to that, because uh, I too have been accused of being arrogant, condescending, dismissive, a giant raving douchebag with no charisma and talent, but putting all that aside, he's uh, he, David Serlin, has calmed down a fair bit in recent years, uh, and it is often hard to be both uh, a sometimes visionary designer and running your own company and presenting yourself as such. So again, I have some degree of sympathy. David Serlin is what I would call an iterative designer. He comes from the world of fighting games, and his job was to balance and fine-tune, and that's evident in his board games as well, because he often takes an existing idea and tweaks it, often by adding special powers. Uh, he did this most clearly in a, in a game like Flash Duel, where he took On Gathered by Reiner Knizia, itself a great game, contrary to whatever David Serlin has to say about it, and added some special powers to it and modified the formula a little bit. He, uh, David Serlin is, after all, the same man who designed a game called Chess 2, and I can leave you to imagine what the inspiration for that was. But similarly, he took Dominion and uh, turned it into Puzzle Strike. He took Poker and turned it into Pandante. Uh, and even Yomi, his first and arguably flagship game, uh, itself is just an evolution of Rock, Paper, Scissors. And here comes Codex. Codex is in many ways an evolution of Magic the Gathering, and we've been seeing iterative improvements on Magic ever since the game came out. Richard Garfield, the designer of Magic the Gathering, almost immediately himself recognized that the fundamental element of the game in terms of the economy, i.e. land and the way it's introduced, was a broken game mechanic, and he's been trying to fix it for a while too, although he since gave up, presumably to rest on his laurels in a giant pile of money. Uh, so, the question now is, is Codex another magic clone? Is it THE magic clone, or is it its own thing? Well, it's a bit of all those things. One of the things that Codex does is it imports some of the design philosophy of real-time strategy computer games. Not in the same way that Ares Project, for example, sought to emulate a real-time strategy game, because it is a very, very, very uh, clear sort of cardboard implementation of the game. You have buildings that produce units, and then you go and you smash these units against each other, and you put down more buildings, and so on and so forth. Uh, it and it's not like the way that uh, some other games try to instantiate MOBA games, like Rum and Bones does, for example. Instead, what Codex does, and this is one of the interesting elements from a, from a design perspective, is it tries to import some of the higher-order strategic concerns of an RTS game into the format of a card game. So, for example, you have things like Build Order in RTS games. And I'm not going to go into that because uh, I'm not particularly well-equipped and you're not here to, to hear about video games necessarily. But in an RTS game, you're never going to see all the units that your side can produce. You have to make some prioritization triage choices in terms of what you're going to deploy and how. Similarly, in Codex, you're not going to see every card in your deck, or every possible card in your deck. Your deck isn't even going to contain every possible card, and not even a fraction of the possible cards. And this is one of the most interesting mechanical elements of the game. That is, how it introduces cards into the system. And this relates to an idea that I'd like to call information throttling. But in order to talk more about that, I need to show you in detail how your deck in a game of Codex evolves. All right, so you've got your deluxe set of Codex, and you've got six available colors from which to choose. In theory, you could mix and match colors, but there are structural and rules impediments to doing so, So it's and it's definitely not recommended in your early games. But, you see, I know something about you. I know you're a person of taste and discernment because you're watching one of my videos, so I know that you want blue because you want the douchebag totalitarian illusionist dickwads. Uh, so when you open up your... Codex. You're going to have three heroes. They just come out, and you generally at the beginning of the game, you can only have one out at a time, so that throttles your information. Just, you know, pick one if you want it to come out. You'll have a starting deck of ten cards. Can't do much about that, although you can trash cards uh, in a game of Codex, so you'll probably be burying some of these to make more workers, which give you gold. A, a callback to RTS games. Now, these are some of the cards in your codex that you can add to your deck. Now, this seems like a lot, and a lot of people will immediately get overwhelmed. At the end of each turn codex, you add two cards from your binder to your deck. And let me just point out that these are actually very well-designed binders. The, the sleeve stops near the top, so you, taking them out or putting them back in is extremely easy. Uh, well done, guys. And 
you might think, well, how am I going to choose between all these cards? Well, here's the deal. You don't actually really have a real choice between all these cards at the beginning of the game. So, on this page here, we have spells, and spells need to be cast by a hero. And you can only have one hero out at the beginning of the game. One of the hero can cast these spells, the other hero can cast these spells, and the other hero can cast these spells. So, you're not going to be mixing and matching from all over here. Realistically speaking, you're probably going to focus on a couple at a time. These spells over here can only be cast from the heroes at max level, which is not something you're going to be likely seeing at the beginning of the game, although if you really want to, you probably could. So this information is throttled in that way. These six cards, on the other hand, you're only going to see after a couple of turns of building up your infrastructure. And once you do that, these cards start to become playable. So these are cards you can start considering uh, even from the beginning of the game, but you don't have to. And then, later on, after yet further prioritization and in infrastructure building, you get access to tech two and possibly three units. And here you might think, again, you're going to be overwhelmed, but no, because you have to specialize in one spec. You can either get these five guys, these five guys, or these five guys, but you like illusions, so you're going to take this one. Trust me, it's the way to go. Uh, and so you don't have to pick when adding cards to your deck or even when deciding what to specialize in from all the things in your binder. You just make, have to make a choice between one of three options. And then there's the level three stuff, and these, the, the tech level three units are basically the game is about to end now because they are redonkulous. And these cards are only become available once you level up to a certain extent, and they just follow from the choice you've already made. And so that is how Codex th throttles information and introduces it to you in stages, so you don't have to worry about everything in every binder. And we're back. Give yourself a moment to catch your breath from the dizzying spectacle of my using a different camera angle. And we're done. One of the things that I find fascinating about different players is that some players are more willing to resort to heuristics sooner than others. What do I mean by this? Well, usually a board game or a card game presents you with a certain amount of information, and whether you think you need to process all of that information or some of that information is a fascinating element of personal gamer preference. Some people resort to heuristics, i.e. shorthands, or just fudges, intuitive fudges, leaps of, of intuition, sooner than others. There's some people who, uh, who I play games with that seem unwilling to resort to heuristics ever. And for them, the only way that they would be able to play Codex, or at least the only way they'd be able to feel that they were playing the game appropriately, is to read every card in their binder, often reread them at several junctures, and also read all the cards in your binder and be aware of all of this at one time. And they're likely going to find the game terrible. If they're not able to, you know, turn off parts of the decision tree, Indeed, in the way that the game does for you by saying, look, you're not ready for Tech 2 yet, much less Tech 3. Here's what you've got on your plate now. And then they're going to find Codex a frustrating experience. At the other end of the spectrum, if you're never willing to look ahead, if you're never willing to look at your binder and say, I'd like to build towards this thing, possibly, and then look at your other options later, then Codex is also going to be a strange experience because when it comes time to level up your buildings, you're not going to know what you should pick. And you're not going to be willing to, do, uh, to, to look through all the cards and decide what it is you want to do in the future. So Codex really works if you're in the sort of same headspace that I am. I like looking ahead, I like trying to make moves that plan ahead, but I am unwilling and to a large extent unable to try to process everything that a game throws at me. I'm going to make shorthands, I'm going to make heuristics, and the way that that cashes out in Codex is I look at the binder and say, well, this Tech 2 unit is one that I like, uh, and so I'm going to try to build towards it eventually. And I'm going to try to get a heuristic or a broad thumbnail sketch of what my opponent is capable of throwing at me and figure, okay, these are the kinds of things I need to deal with, rather than a detailed analysis of all the units. Now, if I played Codex a hundred times, like the designer seems to say is perhaps possible or even the ideal, maybe I would have a good sense of all the possible cards. I'm not there yet, and to be honest, I don't think I'm going to get there yet, because there's a very, very, very small list of games that I've ever played a hundred times. And I don't see Codex hitting that mark, precisely because there are lots of players, simply because of the way they like to process information, for whom Codex is not going to work. Let me give you an example of how these heuristics work. And that's Twilight Struggle. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Twilight Struggle, even if you're not wargamers. In Twilight Struggle, the, decks get, the, decks, the deck changes as the game goes on. 
And whether you're comfortable with not knowing the detailed elements of each part of each card that gets introduced into the game will tell you a lot about what kind of gamer you are. For me, when I sit down to play Twilight Struggle, and the first time that I sat down to play, and indeed the way that I teach new players, is I say, all right, here's the deal. Broadly speaking, the broad historical uh, contours are going to play out, and so you might remember some of the historical events. These are what scoring cards are, and these are what scoring cards are going to come up in each deck. In, in the first deck, these are the scoring cards you need to know, so you know that these, these areas are going to, care, uh, going to score, and you can kind of sort of ignore the later regions. Then these cards are going to score, then these cards are going to score. So you have a rough idea about what matters and when. Uh, sometimes if they really, really want lots of information, I might warn them about some cards like Nasser or like Fidel Castro or what have you. Uh, but by and large, most people I've found are comfortable with, uh, with being surprised by some cards and accepting the fact that you're going to have to play lots of games to really internalize the deck to, the, to that degree. Other people aren't willing to internalize uh, what the deck has at all, and they'll just play Twilight Struggle randomly like a monkey for the rest of their lives. And as a result, they tend not to enjoy it. And then other people find this notion of that many cards existing in the game with unique effects to be maddening because they think it's their job to know all of them, and they get frustrated when they can't. So if you're either of those two people, either the people that can't resort to heuristics or only have heuristics, Codex is apt to be a frustrating experience, and if your primary gaming partner is of the same persuasion, same proviso goes. So let's talk a bit more about some of the other uh, interesting elements of Codex. Codex's patrol zone is, an, is a nice innovation. The way that it works is you decide which units are going to go out on, on patrol. And when your opponent attacks, they can just attack whoever they want. You have no choices when it's not your turn. But first, they have to deal with everyone that's in your patrol zone. They can't go and attack other units or your base until your entire patrol zone has been neutralized one way or the other. What this does is it lets you front load some of your decisions about defense when it is still your turn. And it lets you spend the entirety of your off turn when your opponent is playing, looking at your codex and deciding what to add. But often the choice about what you add to your codex is not going to take the entirety of your opponent's turn, especially if they're a slow player. And so codex has a shocking amount of downtime for how quick the turns are, because the entire time while they're thinking about how to deal with the puzzle you've set up with your patrollers, and how to deal with their hand of cards, and what, what they're going to pay for, and what they're going to save for later, you have nothing to do. In multiplayer, it is even worse, because you have more players to wait and see what they're going to do. And there are no reactions in this game, no instants, no interrupts. Now, to a certain extent, that's great, because it introduces a simplicity and cleanliness. I mean, we all have nightmares about the stack. The stack haunts my dreams, and I didn't even play Magic seriously. And even when I, and even when I played Magic casually, that was over 20 years ago. But I still wake up in cold sweats, and my wife has to look at me and say, Mark, what's wrong? And I have to, I just able to croak up the stack. And she's like, look, it's so easy. First in, last out. And I'm like, ah! At any rate, so the surprise is gone. There's downtime and no surprise. And honestly, I kind of miss the surprise about when I put out a creature and then my opponent says, ah, guess what? This weird thing happens. It's kind of neat. Now, maybe it's not the best for hyper-competitive play, but it is somewhat amusing to see weird shit happen. And more on that later. But at the end of the day, despite the fact that it's got these novel elements like the patrol zone and the way that it introduces cards and the tech tree and so forth... When you get down to Brass Tacks, this is a game about putting out your creatures, dealing with other upgrades and buildings and things, and sending out your 2-4 to go attack some other person's 3-5. And we've been doing variations of that for 20-so-odd years. And to a certain extent, Codex, by being the best iteration that I've yet played of this matching up my creature against your creature kind of deal, has shown me that, you know, I'm, I'm, to a certain extent, I'm over that. If you're still looking for the next big magic thing... If you still get chills of excitement about matching up your different units against other kinds of units in this sort of, you know, 4-5 type of way, then by all means, Codex might be the answer to all of your prayers. But to a certain extent, I'm kind of ready to move on. Maybe I had been for years and it took a design of this solid to show me that I was ready to move on. And then there's the cost. I'm not going to say that it's overpriced. That's not for me to say. And I, I, I think that David Serlin's designer are, uh, are often guilty of either false comparisons uh, to try to make him look like he's over, 
costing his games, and then there are often straw man defenses that his supporters point out. So I'm not going to get involved in any of that mess. What I will say is that if you want all six factions of Codex at this at this time, you're going to have to pay 200 bucks, and once it's gone, it's going to be gone for good. And we don't know how these other factions are going to be released in retail. So to a certain extent, it's an unknown market. But as it stands now, you're going to pay roughly 25 bucks per faction if the core set is anything to, to go by. The core set contains two factions and retails for 50 So when the other expansions get, uh, get released and the other factions that are currently only available exclusively in the Deluxe set get released, we don't know what they're going to cost. We don't even know when they're going to come out. I know it's a bit confusing, but whatever. That's the landscape we live in. And when you compare that to other two-player card battling games, that is a lot of money. It's a significant investment to get into. I mean, everybody knows what they could get for $200 of, of gaming dollars. And you do get an impressive amount of variety. But allow me to compare Codex to some of my other favorites. Let me start with Blue Moon Legends. Blue Moon is a brilliant design. It's one of my all-time favorite games. And out of the box that you pay about 30 to 40 bucks for, you're going to get nine factions and lots of additional cards besides for the purpose of deck building. And it's interesting deck building mechanics. It's not unrestricted. It doesn't overwhelm you with information. And the gameplay itself is really tight and really solid and does uh, manage to walk that fine line between accessibility and rewarding experience. New players can play it with a certain degree of competence, and the more you play with decks, the more the nuances reveal themselves to you. And you have more available factions that it costs about one-fifth the cost. Blue Moon is an absolutely brilliant game, and if you want a two-player card battling game, I highly recommend Blue Moon. And then there are other more recent games, like Ordis Regni. Ordis Regni is an insane value at roughly $45. Uh, you can get it on the web store. It's free shipping anywhere in North America. And it is gratuitously overproduced and beautiful. Uh, the cards are gorgeous. You get these solid laser-etched wooden blocks to build, uh, to build your deck. It, too, has a very novel take on deck building. Uh, it's very quick, very accessible, but allows for a wide variety of play styles. I really, really recommend it. And the best thing about Ortus Regni, to a certain extent, is one of the, the virtues of Codex. You can try it for free right now. Go get the app on Steam. It's a brilliant computer implementation of the card game. I don't like computer implementations of card and board games, but I still play the Ortus Regni uh, program. So give it a shot. See if it's for you. And if so, give them some business. You're not going to pay any shipping for it, and you're not going to regret the components that you get out of the box. Blue Moon also has an AI available to it. Give it a shot. Codex has a print and play available. It's only one hero versus one hero as opposed to three heroes versus three heroes, so it's, technically it's only about a third of what you would experience in a normal game. But it'll show you whether the core mechanics are for you. So to a certain extent, even though I think that it's a very expensive proposition compared to others, you can enter into it with your eyes open. Try it. Try some other things in the market. There are cheaper and freer versions available. On the topic of uh, cheap and cheerful... I feel it is important to mention Epic. Epic is another sort of magic clone, and uh, Epic may not have anywhere near the balance or nuance uh, of a game like Codex, but it does have two key virtues. Number one is crazy stuff happens on turn one, and if you like a little bit of surprise, if you like a little bit of spice in your games, a little bit of wacky uh, randomness and, and, and chaos... Um, the fact that in Epic you can play your strongest things on turn one and it still works as a game is definitely a feature, not a bug. Another thing about Epic is that you can draft in Epic. A lot of people, it's worth remembering, are attracted to Magic primarily as a drafting experience. And drafting is fun. Many drafting card games were specifically designed to, to emulate and capture some of the joy of drafting in Magic. You, there is no drafting mode in Codex. It wouldn't work. It can't work. Uh, but in a game like Epic, you can still play the drafting game. Uh, so if you like drafting and then playing with the deck that you have, if that's what you like about uh, about Magic, you're not going to get that in Codex, but you will in Epic. And Epic's ten bucks. Whatever. It's worth a shot. So, the theme and the art also of Codex are kind of all over the place. Uh, I'm not going to compare it to the, the art in Magic, because, again, I haven't really been in Magic for a long time. Uh, but some of it's goofy, and some of it's intended to be serious. Uh, a number of people with whom I've played Codex have pointed out that the art is discordant. Uh, the styles are different. They don't really match each other uh, in terms of execution. Uh, some people have complained about the overall quality of Codex's art. I, I wouldn't do that necessarily. I think each individual piece is just fine. But taken together, it's a bit of a, a, a mishmash. So... 
at the end of the day, I think the Codex is a very, very interesting design achievement. And to a certain extent, I do think that it is the best iteration of Magic the Gathering-esque that I have ever seen. And the way that it throttles information and allows you to build your deck is really, really, really cool. I encourage you to give it a try if that sounds appealing. But if you're over Magic the Gathering and its clones, or if you're perfectly happy with a cheap and cheerful game like Epic, I don't really see Codex holding much appeal for you. But what do I know? Maybe I'm just a hopeless scrub who can't begin to perceive the genius and balance that is in all the uh, that is all in all the brilliance of David Serlin. If that's what you think, I think you're wrong, but I forgive you. Thanks very much, and take care.